Hi everyone, we're back with lecture 26 on a pretty turbulent time in our nation's history, the late 1960s and early 1970s. By 1968, there was no end in sight to the hostilities in Vietnam. War protests were increasing in size and number. Further, President Johnson's work towards civil rights for all Americans had cost him dearly at the polls in 1964. Southern white voters were abandoning the Democratic Party in droves in protest of this push for integration. We'll see that Johnson will therefore decide not to run for re-election for the presidency in 1968. We're also going to see, again, a younger generation of activists, civil rights activists, taking a much stronger stance against the unceasing racism and discrimination that they continue to experience. Within the African American community specifically, a younger generation coming of age during the late 1960s and early 1970s were increasingly frustrated at the slow pace of racial reform in the United States. They were tired of the notion of gradualism. Gradualism is the idea that if, if we just take things slowly by gradual degrees that we will eventually reach our goal. Yet police beatings still continued. Yet discrimination in the workforce continued unabated for black Americans. Many were denied uh, loan applications for uh, home purchases. It was just the systemic and endemic racism just continued unabated. And for this younger generation of black activists coming of age during this period, they are interested in speaking out much more vocally against this kind of oppression. As leader of SNCC, or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, activist Stokely Carmichael, by the late 1960s, will start to call on black Americans to defend the notion of black power. For this reason, we will see groups like the Black Panther Party forming during the late 1960s. And instead of pursuing a slow pace of integration, the Black Panther Party began focusing on African Americans seizing power in their own communities, becoming business owners, politicians, and citizens who helped out one another, rather than waiting for assistance from the federal government. There was a strong cultural component, too, of the black power movement. Here's where you see this younger generation of civil rights activists reaching all the way back to the 1920s and Marcus Garvey and the UNIA, the idea that you should be proud of your African ancestry rather than trying to minimize it and integrate with white communities. James Brown, a famous musician of the period, uh, sang the song, Say It Loud, I'm Black and Proud. And this sort of encapsulates the idea of the burgeoning uh, black power movement. These younger activists also began staging public protests in which they carried weapons with them. Campaigning against disfranchisement, poor health care, job how and housing discrimination, and police brutality, uh, the Black Panthers assumed um, a much stronger stance in the eyes of the public than previous uh, civil rights organizers had. And the Black Panthers were really tapping into a deep vein of discontent in the black community. For instance, in 1965, riots erupt, erupted in an L.A. neighborhood known as Watts when a white highway patrolman beat a black motorist. This escalated into six days of rioting and looting. Thirty-four people died, and hundreds of businesses were ransacked and destroyed. This nationwide coverage of National Guardsmen patrolling the streets of L.A. shocked and scared white Americans. So, too, did of images like the one that you can see here on the slide of um, leather coat wearing, um, gun toting, black power movement activists such as the Black Panther Party. For many white Americans, they perceived these changes in the tone of the civil rights movement uh, as being a scary development. 
This despite the fact that for the Black Panthers, their movement was within their own communities. They were the ones trying to provide job location assistance. The Black Panthers helped to sponsor the creation of low-cost health care clinics within black communities. They were really focused at improving the day-to-day -day lives of African Americans. However, for middle-class white Americans, they're freaking out during this period. They're worried that this is the beginning of, uh, of an uprising among blacks nationwide. You will also see youth activists emerging in the late 1960s in another community that had historically been the subject of discrimination and oppression, the Mexican-American community. Groups like the Brown Berets, which originated in Los Angeles, began demanding a similar set of changes in American society. They, too, wanted to end police brutality against their community members. They, too, wanted to see an end to job discrimination, to segregation in housing. They wanted better access to health care for their community. They, too, also began adopting a partial military-style dress, complete with guns and berets and, and military-style jackets. And, in fact, brown berets and uh, Black Panther members sometimes uh, crossed paths and supported one another's efforts to help out the lives of their community members. So the Chicano movement is really kind of embodied by this push among a younger generation, uh, especially of Hispanic Americans, to try and end the systemic racism and discrimination that they too had been enduring for far too long. Several other strong voices emerged from the growing Chicano movement of the 1960s, especially surrounding the issue of workers' rights. Dolores Huerta, for example, along with Cesar Chavez, co-founded the National Farm Workers Association in 1962. Huerta and Chavez protested the poor pay and the horrid, brutal working conditions of agricultural laborers in the United States, most of whom were of Hispanic origin. They would later merge with another labor union in 1966, the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, comprised largely of Filipino farm workers, also living in dire poverty. The joining of these two labor movements led to the United Farm Workers of America. They helped to organize labor strikes around the country to protest uh, the mistreatment of workers, the poor pay, these sorts of things. Unfortunately, while the UFW, the United Farm Workers of America, were a group dedicated to nonviolent resistance, we will see some of these labor protests erupt in violence between police and organizers. And all of these social and labor movements were making many middle-class white Americans increasingly anxious over time. It was also making the government nervous. Several presidents, beginning with Eisenhower, will begin asking the FBI to monitor some of these organizations. Even FBI investigations into labor unions, like the National Farm Workers Association, um, uh, based uh, were really based upon false allegations, it turned out, that the union was spreading communist doctrine to farm laborers. The federal government will also increase FBI oversight of groups like the Black Panthers and the Brown Berets. They became worried that these groups were trying to incite the spread of communist doctrine throughout the United States. You can see here is a memorandum uh, specifically targeting the Black Panther Party. Uh, in 1968, the Atlanta Bureau and uh, the Boston Bureau were coordinating, uh, trying to monitor these groups along with SNCC or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Even Dr. King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference, a group of ministers were targeted by the FBI for surveillance uh, and trying to gather data on these groups in an in effort to silence them, ultimately. A key spokesperson for the emerging black nationalist movement or black power movement uh, was Malcolm X. Born Malcolm Little in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, his who was born into a family of civil rights activists. Tragically, his father Earl Little's civil rights activism ultimately ended up in the family being harassed and chased out of the city of Omaha. Um, 
they ultimately ended up moving to Michigan and their house was burned down by uh, angry white supremacists. Uh, two years later, in 1931, his father was murdered, again, most likely by KKK members. These early tragedies had a deep and lasting effect on Malcolm Little. Unfortunately, his grieving mother um, was later put in a mental institution uh, with a lack of positive role models. He ended up moving to Boston and kind of fell into a criminal life for a period of time. He was eventually arrested and imprisoned for 10 years. And while there, he began reading behind bars. He joined the Nation of Islam and dropped his surname Little as a relic of slave days. And on his release in 1952, he became the chief voice for the Nation of Islam and the budding Black Power movement. Malcolm X did not advocate violence. He did, however, advocate the idea of self-defense for members of the black community. Um, as you can see from the quotation that I have here on the slide, he is very clear that that all human beings uh, uh, have a right to be respected, to be given the rights by their society, and uh, we intend to bring into existence by any means necessary, he said, uh, our full recognition as of the black community in the United States. Again, for white Americans, they took this type of rhetoric, simply the rhetoric of self-defense, we won't be beaten anymore, or, you know, uh, tortured and murdered anymore. For many white Americans, they took this and began, became incredibly worried that the black power movement was going to morph or change into a force for evil in American society. Unfortunately, Malcolm X was murdered in 1965 by political enemies within the Nation of Islam, and this won't be the last time we will see violence uh, directed at many of the most eloquent spokesmen and in the United States for civil liberties. One bright spot, however, during this period was Johnson's work on the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which is sometimes referred to as the Fair Housing Act. This piece of legislation prohibited discrimination concerning the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, religion, national origin, or sex. It was intended as a follow-up to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Sadly, that bill will be passed just days after a national and international tragedy, which was the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis in April of 1968. 1968 was an especially turbulent year. Dr. King was gunned down at a Memphis hotel and soon afterwards when news spread of his killing, rioting erupted in cities across the country, some 168 towns convulsed by violence, looting, and disorder. 34 black Americans, 5 white Americans died in the resulting chaos. Frustration only continued to mount within the black community. That same year, several months later, Senator Robert F. Kennedy, the brother of late President John F. Kennedy, um, was also killed in California. 1968 is a presidential election year, and Robert Kennedy was seeking the Democratic nomination for the presidency. He supported ending the Vietnam War. He supported further civil rights legislation. And when he was killed uh, by a Palestinian nationalist in 1968, uh, the black community just, again, this is a major setback for their movement forward. In addition to uh, some of the rioting and problems associated with the Democratic Convention meeting in Chicago that year in 1968, we'll also continue to see uh, problems abroad for U.S. troops fighting in Vietnam. If you'll recall, we discussed in early 1968 the Tet Offensive, a massive counterattack from the North Vietnamese troops crossing over into South Vietnam. This will show Americans that the war is not, in fact, about to end. This reinvigorates the anti-war movement here in the United States. We'll talk more about the election of 1968 in the second part of this lecture.